This is Beyond Busy. I'm Graham Alcott. I'm the author of a number of books, including the global bestseller, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. And I'm the founder of Think Productive. We help people to make space for what matters and get more done. And we partner with some of the world's leading companies who share our mission to transform the world of work. Beyond Busy is where I explore the often messy truths and contradictory relationships around topics like work-life balance, happiness and success, and explore with interesting people what makes them tick. In short, this is where we ask the bigger questions about work. My guest today is Helen Sanderson. Helen is a professional organiser and the creator of the Home Declutter Kit. She's also the author of The Secret Life of Clutter, And so in this episode, we talk about our relationship with our stuff, the parallels between decluttering and productivity, and why it's important to get clarity in everything we do. There's some real emotional depths to the book. I really love reading it, and I hope you're gonna enjoy the episode just as much. This is Helen Sanderson. Uh, I'm with Helen Sanderson, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Uh, lovely to be here. Um, So welcome to Beyond Busy, and we're going to talk about your book, The Secret Life of Clutter. Um, And what's nice, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see Helen has a a beautiful space uh, just behind you there, Helen, which uh, is like obviously just not a surprise, (laughs) just uh, meeting you. Um, But I really enjoyed the book, The Secret Life of Clutter. And I wanted to start with um, something that you say, which is, Clutter is decisions that haven't been made. So my first question is, why are people not making those decisions? Um, I, (laughs) I think, um, because I, I I think we all have decision fatigue. I mean, do you remember when you used to go for a coffee and you just get a coffee and now it's, do you want a flat white (laughs) or a cappuccino or an espresso or, you know, it's like, that's just one micro moment where you're, you know, bombarded with decisions and um and you know we have we have busy full lives we're also bombarded by social media by marketing by choices and and i think that um i think quite a lot of people run away to their home to try and get away from you know decision fatigue but now it's on your computer and we were we were just talking before i press record about how obviously the title of this podcast is Beyond Busy. Do you think there's a, a a sort of straightforward parallel between people who are busy and clutter? So more of the people that you would see in your work who have a lot of clutter would generally be quite busy people. I think a, a lot of people that I work with are cluttered because they're busy and they um, want a lot out of their life and they're, you know, perhaps we're all getting a little bit um, hungry for more experiences and and the home is becoming a sort of a lower priority. And so, you know, we want to to go out and experience things or do online courses or go on, you know, run three businesses quite often or have a job and a business. And, you know, so the home is sort of kind of deprioritized. And quite often people are saying to me, well, you know, I come home from work and I just haven't got time or I haven't got any energy. I've given 150% to my business or to my work. Don't ask me or tell me to kind of go and do the dishes. <laughs> you know? And and it's just sort of, there's this kind of perhaps a need that the home is supporting us, but actually we need to support the home to support us. It's a kind of a, a, a mutual mutual thing. Yeah, which um, we'll come on to that. But I'm curious about that idea that if you're giving everything to work, then you're taking something away from the home. And I suppose that's like at the heart of of work-life balance, isn't it? And how we think about that. And some of the stories in your book, there's a couple of people in the book who it sounded like they wouldn't have had clutter in their work. They were very, you know, A-type, organised. And then when they got home, there was, it was like a completely different story. So... Why, why do you think people are sort of um, not holding themselves to those same kind of um, standards around decision making or why, why don't people think in the same way in both both places? Well, I think, I mean, the story of Natalie, who um, she, um, you know, ha- had had to perform really well at work and, and actually shared her home 
But um, so all of the living shared spaces were organized and tidy, but her own room was was not. And it's and it's something about um, when we do something to get approval with other from other people. Um, you know, we have different standards. So if I go to work, then I can please my boss, or if I have flatmates that I want to have a good impression with. But actually, in my own room, it's a completely different story. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to get at in the book is like. This is about your relationship with yourself. So when it comes to being in your room, then when when do you make yourself important enough to make that space really work for you? And it is about balance. It's totally about balance. Exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Um, it struck me a lot in the book how just how emotional it was um, and how, you know, you start out thinking about um, where you start start about thinking about, I was going to say, this stuff, you know, stuff that sort of just feels like it's these inanimate objects. But you you talk about possessions. You had a really interesting take on possessions. Um, do you want to just explain? There's like three meanings of possessions that you talk about. Well, that the possessions possess you is the yeah. is the kind of the the fundamental thing, and that you know that we put meaning into possessions. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, something, one of the things that people think about, you know, well, you just, just tidy up your home or just let things go or, you know, but, but actually we imbue possessions with, with stories about our lives. And, and, you know, if you can, if you work with somebody who's very, very attached to their stuff, they'll tell you a story about every single thing. And you'll suddenly feel the weight of of all of that, you know that that and our possessions locate us in our history as well. So there's um, there's a huge amount of of owning a possession and a possession owning you. And then the other one was like stuff um, is possessed, right? So there's like stories inside things. That like there's a couple of really um, strong examples of the book where you're talking about people looking at photographs and um the the shape of a room and where the bed was and these things where it's like it feels like there's there's a, a you know a possession happening within those those things that's constantly kind of talking to you and and constantly kind of telling you a story back even down to like you say in the book like your tooth your toothbrush is telling you to brush your teeth and stuff like that yeah i mean but i think people use that don't they they you you know like People, I mean, I, in my experience, people hold on to things and they, you know, I, I say that that we have um, under under a pile of clutter is a is a is a dream or a vision or something that hasn't been realized. And um, and the reason that, you know, when you clear the clear through clutter, you'll find the little memories. There'll be things that you've kept. There'll be little objects that you have left for yourself to relocate yourself to remember those things. So, um, I mean, I worked with one woman who, and she had all these, you know, I don't know if you've ever drunk puka tea, but they have beautiful designs on their, um, on their packaging. And she just had a cupboard of empty tea, tea packets. And we, you know, we were exploring what is that? And she said, Oh, that's, that's my creativity. And, and it was just such a, and that's a sort of a symbol of that reminder for her that to, to keep connected to her creativity. And I said, well, let's, let's try and get it out of the cupboard and, and, and give it a new life rather than, you know, so, um, but you know, you can, you can see that in that story about the photographs, um, that you can almost relive a memory through a photograph. It's almost like it will transport you back in time to that experience, which, you know, is a, is a really, is a really beautiful thing, but also for some people quite traumatic as well. And you talked about the emotional aspect of it. That, that's another reason why some people, they, they don't want to go through their house because they don't want to find things that remind them of bad things. So, you know, it's very complicated mm. and really fascinating. Obviously I'm fascinated by it. <laughs> yeah. And I suppose, so you could, I'm kind of guessing there's also a sense that you don't want to be reminded of those things if there's like a traumatic event or something has happened or whatever. But you, I guess you also deep down, you still know it's there, mm. right? So it's like you can't, like you can't fool yourself completely, right? Well, I think, I think, I mean, 
one of, one of the things that I think about um, clutter, because I talk about that, you know, your home has a story to tell you. And one of the most fascinating things is if you wake up in the morning and you have a dream and you know that your dream is trying to tell you something and that hidden within your unconscious, there's this mechanism that is prompting you to, to heal or to deal with something or to get back in balance exactly, you know, maybe that is work-life balance, maybe that is creative work balance, maybe that is some sort of balance. So I I do feel that, you know, even that we kind of unconsciously leave these little reminders for ourselves around the house in, in the same way that a dream is kind of prompting you to think about something. So one of the things that happened as I was reading your book, I started sort of mentally scanning through my own house and, and my garden office here. And and I've just been on this book deadline. And that generally is the time for me where I just, things just get, uh, you know, neglected and little bits of clutter build up on desks that usually are, are pretty clear and stuff like that. Um, and you talk about in the book some questions that people should ask around this stuff. And obviously there's there's like the Marie Kondo thing of does this spark joy? And you actually say, Whilst that's a good question to ask, there's some maybe some better or some deeper questions that we should be asking about our stuff. And I also think this is like really kind of linked to productivity as well when I was um, reading it. So do you want to just explain the the questions that people should ask about their stuff? Um, so, yeah, just before I, I dive into that, um, just, to, just to say that, you know, I think it's completely normal that when you're on a book deadline that, you're, that your life has gone into slippage. And, and that's... Yeah. You know, I'm I'm on also on a deadline, and and that happens to me. And one of the things people really enjoy asking me is, "Are you tidy?" <laughs> you yeah, know, right. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm really into life happens, and we have to move with it. Um, but in terms of the questions, um, I think, I think that uh, connected to what I was saying before, um, we locate stuff into objects, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. And, um, you know, when I do workshops with people, I get them to think about and to actually dialogue with objects and possessions. So I might get them to ask, why are you still here? You know, a bit like the um, the the tea um, packaging, you know, wh- what is it that you need from me? You know, is, is there something that I'm not not thinking about? And what what do you have to tell me? You know, so sometimes like I've done this with um, people who uh, have uh, full wardrobes and they'll they'll have a dress in there that they never wear. And so they do a little ask these questions with the dress and it says, go out and have fun. (laughs) You know, so it's you can actually access quite a deep psychological kind of um, relationship with yourself if you have a little bit of a dialogue with those with those objects and and then how can I let you go um it will you know go out and have fun or let some often an object will say let somebody else use me you know let you know I don't like living I don't like living in the cupboard it's dark you know I want to go out and party you know and and something about have asking those questions it creates a lightness and it also creates another life beyond you know, the dark wardrobe of, you know, where these things are living or the, you know, stuffed under under the stairs. And so, you know, the these objects start to come to life in and 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 have a new meaning. And I mean that may sound a bit bonkers, but I really do feel that that, you know, in my experience talking to people, that some some sort of shift happens. And I think the essence of my work and what I'm trying to say to people is that it, you know, for some people it is just stuff, you know, and, and that's that's how it is. But for other people, it's a little bit more complicated. And and we project meaning and value and and stories into our objects. And and part of the way of letting that go and moving on is to um start a bit of a dialogue ask some of those questions and and that starts a shift of liberating so i always say to people start with why why is it that you can't let go of that object rather than you know does this spark joy or not but why am i holding onto this so tightly and the other the other thing that we talk about in the book is keepage you know like often people say well i've kept so long <laughs> that i have to keep keeping it for another 20 years you know it's sort of it's almost like it's it's earned an investment in my home 
ask. I love that word keepage. And it also struck me that it's almost like a sort of emotional sunk cost, isn't it? So if you think about that in productivity terms, I'm sure everybody has something on their to-do list that they've been meaning to do for a while. and It's not necessarily the top priority, but it sits on the to-do list and it's been looked at for so often that it's almost like it earns its place on the to-do list. And I also think of the keepage in um, terms of some of the stuff that I've got in my office. Like I've got a couple of old laptops in here and stuff that I'm not using anymore. But part of me thinks, oh, there's probably some stuff I need to retrieve from there. And I've, you know, I've moved it, moved them around or whatever to the point where they've sort of earned their place a little bit. But really, I probably should, what should I do with that then? Do it like where, maybe that's the other thing is um, clutter is decisions that you haven't made. And I just don't quite know the best thing to do. I don't want to just put them in the recycling or whatever. So, like, so I have to send, send them off somewhere. What do I do with my old laptops? Um, I'm. I guess you wipe the the stuff that you want to keep from it, or you, you know, you upload that onto the onto the cloud, and then you either sell them on, or pass them on, or recycle them, or you know. But I think that that's sort of one of the mundane decisions that we don't kind of want to make. And um, I mean, the way I work with people is like, look, come on, let's let's just take three days and intensively work on this, or you know, three. I say three days, but you know. So give yourself as if you were um, going on a detox retreat, you know, you wouldn't expect yourself to be doing a juice fast and running a business and bringing up your kids, you know. Yeah. So sometimes it's it's good to just um, take some time to deal with the mundane, because once you've dealt with those um, keepage items like those old computers, and I tell you, everyone has got a, an old laptop and a drawer full of wires that they an think they might need one well, day. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and it just I I think my my philosophy is that you carry that in your mind, and every so often you've got that little nag in your head that says, you know, that old laptop, you should really deal with it, and that takes up bandwidth that that then means that you you're sort of clouding your capacity to to be productive and to think clearly. So you know, taking a couple of days to really sit down and say, look, I'm just going to deal with those mundane things in my life and get them out of my head you know people will say oh the loft I've got to do the loft and it will be every day in their life do the loft do the loft and you just think all of that energy and rhetoric that goes on and on in your head that could actually you know be dealt with and all the other thing is that you know once people have dealt with the loft and or the old computer they're just like it's like they've got tons of energy back you would be so surprised by how much mental weight all of those decisions that haven't been made get, you know, carried. For sure. I tell I tell a story on when I'm doing productivity workshops and I'm talking about the the importance of just getting the ideas out of your head and starting to see it in front of you. Um that a few years ago there was there's this plant in my hallway and it was so like you know, the roots were kind of beating out of the side of this pot. It just really needed repotting. It really needed a much bigger pot. And for weeks and weeks, if not months and months, I was just walking past this plant every time I walked up and down the hallway, you know, several times a day. And just every time, I was like, oh, I must do that, I must do that. And then one week when I was just in the middle of doing my little weekly review process, I, I wrote down, you know, go to the, uh, the little shop around the corner, um, buy a new pot. And I just wrote that down. About a week later, I was walking down that street and I wasn't even checking with my lists or, or looking at it. But suddenly I was just almost like on autopilot. I found myself in this shop buying this plant pot and taking it home. And it was just something really powerful about having written it down. I've made the decision in a really clear way. And then the rest of it would just look after itself, you know, and suddenly the, it's repotted. And I'll tell you what, the other the other side of that was just the energy that I got every time I then walked past the same plant in the same spot, but just it was in a different pot, I just felt, ah, oh, cool, I did it. You know, and it just, it gave me a very different um, energy. So I think it's a really important thing, isn't it? That that dialogue that we have with ourselves and then getting that out of the internal and onto something external, whether it's an app or paper or just, you know, making those decisions um, real by um, stop, stopping it just being a conversation we're having with ourselves. 
I mean, I could get really esoteric on you or, or you know, quantum physics. So every, everything has energy, doesn't it? Even those sort of um, hard matter things are vibrating. And, you know, maybe the plant is kind of saying to you, screaming, help, I need another pot. And, you know, so it, it's, I, I think that we're multidimensional beings and that the, the vibrations of our spaces is having an impact on us, not just mentally, but physically, you know, so... Um, I, I love that story. And I think that's a really great example of what I'm talking about in terms of, you know, those decisions that you don't make are nagging at you. And it is the, it is the, um, the kind of fundamental core thing that actually, when I say that to people, they're like, oh my goodness, of course, you know, I just need to sit down and make a decision. And sometimes the decision is where am I going to put this or when am I going to do this or, um, where am I going to give this to, you know, and it's just a case of giving yourself the mental time and space to make those decisions. Yeah, I want to come on to the practical bit in a minute. But just while we're on that slightly esoteric bit there, like, um, one of the things I really felt reading the book is that you almost have a dialogue with spaces, like you sort of often describe in the book, I walked into this corridor and I could see that it felt tired or I walked into this place and it felt really, you know, vibrant and chaotic or exciting or whatever. Um, I, my sense is that like not everybody has that. And so is that a bit of a superpower that you have? And is have you always had that? Just like, I'd just love to know more about that sense that you have to just feel a space and feel a message or a, you know, a, an emotion from a, from a space like that. You know, you know what? I went to see my osteopath one time and she just went, you know, like that straight onto this painful bit in my shoulder. And I went, how the hell did you know it was exactly there? And she just laughed. And, and it was just sort of this kind of idea that, you know, when you work with a body or you work with a home, you do develop this kind of fine tuned sort of capacity to, to really listen. And, you know, I don't know when you do something all the, all the time, I'm sure you're the same with productivity. As soon as you can see the errors or where people are getting stuck. And, um, and, you know, I, I mean, my background is I went to art school and, and I was creating installations even in my twenties. So, and my fascination was how, how can I give someone an experience with a space so it's really interesting when I look back to that and I just think actually spaces have been um, my passion really for for many years. And, and then at one point I was designing um, quiet rooms and, and meditation spaces and environments where you, as soon as you walk in the door, you feel like somebody's taken this load off of you, you know, where you can just go, ah, oh, like that. And I feel that your home should be that space. You know, you walk through the front door somebody takes your coat and you go, ah, oh. but for a lot of people, it's the, you know, the place that they shut, shut out of the world or they won't let anyone in. And they're, um, you know, it's a place they feel ashamed of or uptight in or, or stressed about. Um, and, and actually it's the place where you go to, to heal. And it's the place where you go to recharge or to rejuvenate or to refresh. And if it isn't a place that's supporting you, then where are you getting that support? To, to go out and be in the big wide world. So I think of your home as like your secure base or your, you know, your flight deck, you know, where you run your world from. And, and if your flight deck's in a mess, would you get on a plane <laughs> with somebody who was flying, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it, it has been something that I feel very attuned to. And actually some of my clients, when they, when they come to me, they say, oh, I really feel the space and my partner doesn't understand. And I said, no, but I understand, you know, I understand. And you can tell when somebody's got that sixth sense in a way. And I also say to people, you know, some people are really brilliant with numbers. Some people are brilliant with words and some people are brilliant with colors and some people, you know, some people are brilliant with people. And I just, I don't know if I'm brilliant, but I'm good with spaces. <laughs> and I and I can really, I can, as soon as I've got the person and the space, it, there's a story that starts to unfold. Yeah. And it's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, maybe just before we get onto a couple of those stories, um, your process, the getting clear process. So you you kind of equate the idea of what we do in the home with, 
gardening and what we do in the garden. So you've got weeding and then planting and then maintenance. So for anyone listening to this, I suppose this is like the practical essence of mm-hmm. what you can do around around clutter, right? So do you want to just explain those three steps, the weeding, the, the planting yeah. and the maintenance? So, I mean, the reason I use the garden analogy is because we, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, I don't have a garden, it's too much work. (laughs) But actually, we all have a home and a home is work. And for some reason, we don't realize that, you know, there's, and even if you're really lucky and you've got cleaners and other people that can do stuff, there's still stuff that only you can do. You know, only you can clean your teeth, right? Um, So um, the thing about the gardening is that um, if you imagine an overgrown garden, you you can't even see what you've got in there. You don't even know how big the garden is in it anymore. And so the first thing you've got to do is do the weeding and you've got to cut back the weeds. So cut back all the brambles. And then you've once you've cleared out all the weeds, you can see the space. So the first thing is the decisions about what can go. What's a weed? What what don't I need anymore? And then once you can see the space, you can then revision it. You can say, well, okay, I've when I've done this weeding, I found this apple tree and actually want to keep that. And I and I want to keep the rose bush. That's lovely. But I but actually what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put some decking and, and a water feature and I'm gonna, you know, redesign this. And and then you've you've got your garden designers in and it's all been that's the planting plan. And then of course you've got to maintain it because if you don't it's going to grow back to a big pile of brambles. And, and so, you know, people often say, well, what happens if, you know, I, if I declutter, then quite often it goes back to how it was before. And that's really where the habits, you know, learning new habits, um, learning new ways of um, supporting yourself, being, um, I don't know, thinking of it as a, rather than a chore and drudger, drudgery, thinking of it perhaps as a mindfulness practice or th- perhaps thinking yeah. of, of um, making the bed in the morning as a way that you, that you take care of yourself. So it's a lot of it is about mindset and changing your mindset about, you know, I can, I can maintain this space. And obviously if you maintain your garden and it doesn't take a huge amount to do, does it? A little bit of watering, a little bit of mowing the lawn, and then you've got this beautiful space that you can enjoy. Yeah, for sure. And what so in that definition, um, one of the things that sort of struck me was um, like when you when you're doing the the weeding and the working out. So with the story of Natalie, you talk about Natalie having this um, this drawer, and it's called the don't know drawer. And that I found really interesting because I think again, there's a really nice parallel with with productivity. There is that sometimes where we're stuck and we're procrastinating is because we've we've we realize that there's a decision that we haven't made and yet what we haven't done is given ourselves the the sort of grace period to say what other information do i need to gather before i can make the decision or can i just put this off for three weeks and defer it till then or you know will i you know will i sort of park this and come back to it in six months or whatever there's lots of different ways that we can move forward with something that don't involve having to know right now what to do um, do you want to just explain a bit about the don't know draw? Because that felt like a really powerful thing with that story of, of Natalie's. Yeah. So in my home declutter kit, which I produced, um, you know, five, about five years ago, it's a set of cards that um, are a set of decisions that people are likely to make during their decluttering process. And there's two cards that I love very much. Um, one of them is the, the uh, don't know card and the other one is the gremlins card. Yeah, I was going to come so, on to Gremlins actually as well. Okay. So yeah, tell us well, about they, both of Yeah, so the Gremlins is, you know, please don't, don't, I can't go there. You know, it's a, it's a raw, raw situation. It's a relationship or a trauma or something. Maybe you've just had a bereavement. So you put it in a, in a box and wrap it up and put it aside and you give yourself, um, I don't know, a year or six months or whatever to, to just leave it. And then the don't know card is, um, where you maybe you need to sleep on it or maybe you need to um talk to someone about it or maybe you need to take it to your therapist or something but it's it's a bit more current than the gremlins which are <clears throat> which have been put away and and it's so important because if you're making you know we talked at the beginning about decision fatigue and if you're making a lot of decisions about your possessions 
that's you can't make all of those decisions perfectly and some of them are going to need to be thought about or reflected on or slept on or something and so I mean particularly with Natalie she was um she struggled to make decisions and she she you know I mean I would I don't recommend a don't know draw but um it worked for her and and you know everybody's different and uh we had an agreement that it was, you know, you can have a don't know draw for a week, but then you need to deal with a don't know draw. You can't just have a don't know draw forever because <laughs> otherwise it's a get out of jail card, isn't it? Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes I use, so I have an old fashioned in tray um, that's just on the shelf next to my desk and I just chuck all the little bits in there, you know, the receipts that I need to photograph and all those little bits and pieces for, um, you know, sort of coming back to household bills and all that sort of thing and I know I'm going to file them later but I just pile them all up there and then generally about once a week I'll just empty all of that back out but it really helps me and also the other thing I'll do is I'll just with little paper notelets just if I'm having ideas I just find it quicker to just if I'm at my desk and I have an idea just to write it down chuck it in there rather than to get my phone out and get the app out and all that so I just find it an easier um, way of operating but I suppose in a way like it's not necessarily a don't know, don't know, but it's it's like a conscious thing of I'm deferring this for now. I'm not going to let this interrupt what I'm doing. I'm just going to pile it up there and sort of come back to it later. The interesting thing about gremlins, though, is that I also think that if you have something that you're you're putting aside and saying I'm going to come back to this in a year's time, like so to me that feels like that's a decision in itself, isn't it? Like that's a, a decision in itself to say. This is something I'm. I know that I don't have the capacity to deal with for whatever reason, and I'm just going to leave that and come back to it another time. And it sort of, I don't know. It just it really reminds me of, um, uh, like some of the stuff around productivity with, um, you know, just just putting stuff on your calendar for six months ahead or a year ahead rather than committing to it now. That can be really freeing because what it does is it it's a form of that weeding, isn't it? Where what you're doing is is creating the space to then really focus on the stuff that does need to be done now and sort of putting those other things, you know, um, over to one side kind of thing. Absolutely. I mean, I would say that what you're doing with your receipts is exactly what I would recommend, you know, that you, that you just sort of pile them for, for a while and then get to it, but, but do it on a regular basis. So the thing about gremlins is that, you know, even if you're putting them aside for a year, you've made a decision to put it aside and yeah. and it's in making that decision that empowers you because you you you've taken control so quite often people say i don't know where to start and it's almost like the house is like going oh you know and it, and it's it's the house is kind of and the stuff has taken over it, it's it's in control and when you start taking back control and saying no actually this i'm going to i'm going to sleep on that this i'm going to deal with next year I mean, it's, it is the same as in a business. You know, I've got an online course <laughs> that I'm trying, that I've wanted to make for years. And, you know, you have to realize your capacity, don't you? And you have to say, well, actually, this is going to have to wait. And so that's my gremlin for, for a while. It's over there. And it's about being realistic with yourself. But when you do that and you say, that's project 2023 or, you know, December 2022, that's empowering. Whereas having the, the the um the online course going nag 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 then you just feel a sense of defeat and and i i think one of the things that i really encourage people to do is is to feel a sense of success that you know even if you're just keeping one area of your house maintained you're winning you know so do 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 and i think you probably would say the same in terms of productivity do things that you feel you're good at get you know build your sense of self-esteem and then you get more courageous about doing the next the next bit and i'd say some of those decisions um are also about self-kindness aren't they it's it's you know you're either saying hey this is something that i'm not going to have the capacity to let me recognize that and own that and then part of that might also be hey this is a thing that i need in in some way or another to get support from someone else around or get training around or approach in a different way later with you know with more information or more skill so i just think there's a there's a kindness to that than rather than set yourself expectations that are too big um so that yeah that just felt like a really important um bit and there was also a bit in that chapter that said um 
uh, once you have more physical space, you have more emotional and more mental space, which, yeah, I just feels like that's a real theme in your work, isn't it? It's, it's about is kind of creating space and letting stuff, um, you know, putting stuff away to create space that has more energy around it and is and can have more momentum around it. Yeah, and, and making space for the new, you know, so many, actually, when I was thinking, looking at all the, the people that I wrote about, you know, they've all moved on. You know, some have had children, some have moved countries, you know, some have met the love of their life, you know. So actually, when you make when you make space, you actually make space for something new to come in. But when you fill your space, you you kind of, there's a staticity or a stuckness that that sort of stops the flow of life. So, um, you know, creating space and making space for the new and, um, and your creative life is, is something that I'm really, really passionate about. Yeah. Um, you also talk in the book about, so there's like a bit of a myth that goes on. And, and so you come from an arts background as well, um, about the creative people are the ones who live in clutter and it, they kind of need mm. the clutter to... Uh, be able to operate and you kind of do away with that a bit in the book do you want to talk about that so and also I'm really curious so when you were at art school and and doing installations was your house really cluttered too (laughs) the inevitable question about my house (laughs) uh, my desk is a mess at the moment because I (laughs) I've got lots of projects on but my house is generally okay and Hmm. um I, I had um I worked in a bookshop once and I had a um uh, a boss who said she said you're the greatest combination of creative and an order that I've ever mm, you know that right. I've ever known and I maybe maybe I'm lucky like that or you know maybe my mum just trained me well but um you know I think that we do you know a lot of people when I when I do start with the why and we do do a little bit of a, a deep dive into you know their history some people never learned some stuff so you can be creative and chaotic, but maybe you never really learned um, what order and structure is. And and you can learn that. It's never necessarily going to be your strength. But, um, yeah. you know, we all have to, you know, I'm not brilliant with numbers, but I've, I've had to learn to be you know, on top of it. It's but it's not the domain that I that I live in. So um I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's really easy to do to make generalizations. I, I knew somebody once who was an amazing creative artist, and she had one room that was a complete, um, how can I describe it? A complete mess. You know, it was oil paints everywhere. And then when you shut the door, the rest of the flat was meticulous. And I just thought, what an amazing woman that she's kind of found this perfect balance between allowing her inner artist to completely go to town in her studio and and then the other part of herself um and I often talk about our different parts and and how though we meet their needs um how the other part of herself you know met her need for order and and simplicity so um I do think that it is something that we that we kind of um we all have to struggle with that you know whether you're giving 150 percent to your work and then not giving yourself anything, then, um, you know, that's something that that needs to kind of come back into balance. So I think balance is something that I'm really passionate about. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it, well, I mean, I just asked you about your house there. So uh, why don't I ask you about mine? So just as we were uh, coming onto the call, I, I said, I kind of got a bit, uh, I had that thing where I'm sure you get all the time where it's like, oh, talking to the person who talks about clutter, they're like, Maybe maybe I'm cluttered. So I, I asked you, do you think my books look a bit cluttered? And you said, well, they don't, but they also tell a story. And so um, I guess there's two parts of that. It's like, do you, do you have a sense of, um, are there some really common themes to those stories that people tell? And then also like, yeah, what, what story does it tell? Just I'm curious, knowing that you're so attuned to spaces and whatever, like what, what story does it tell when you, you look at my books and background behind well i i think the story that it tells is is you know partly that that you're um interested in knowledge so you're you're an intellectual you're um you know you're 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 bright 
you read, you stimulate your mind. So your mind is and your head space is important to you. And it's also part of your identity. Yeah. So it's, it's something, you know, and you're a writer and you write brilliant books. And so therefore, you know, it, it to have have that background, you know, it, it sort of it does make sense. Um, are there well? Are there some uh, some? Uh, I just wonder if there are like almost like archetypes to this stuff. Like, are there sort of um, common common stories that you either see people telling or that are naturally told unconsciously? I think that I'm, you know, I'm very interested in personality types, and I think that we express ourselves in our homes, and we express some of our identity in our home. So, um, you know, an intellectual will have a lot of books. And, you know, and they'll be, they'll be kind of almost status symbol symbols, you know, like this is who I am. These are an expression of me. And, you know, we know that we dress up um, wearing our clothes to express ourselves, but we also do that in our home as well. You know, so if you're a vibrant, colorful person, you're going to want to express your vibrancy in your home. So you can immediately tell, you know, about a personality Um, you know some people are much more functional orientated and then they're not interested in aesthetics and beauty they're just interested in functionality does this work can I get from A to B and and that will show in their home as well so um, you know our homes do tell a story of our personality and our values and you know and and when we have an inner conflict about that and that something about that isn't working or perhaps we're living outside of our value system or we haven't quite got an alignment with that yet, that will probably, that conflict will be expressed in the house too. So I think earlier on we were talking about, um, you know, keepage. And I was thinking actually what, what popped into my mind and I didn't say it at the time was, you know, if you've invested a lot in, in a training or in a business and it's not working, there is this part of you that wants to keep going and to keep holding on to it. It's really, really hard to let go of something that you've invested a lot of money in, a lot of time in, you know, or you've kept it for a long time. But actually, you know, um, I mean, most spiritual (laughs) philosophies are about, you know, let go and, and detach, you know, we don't need all of this stuff. And, you know, ultimately, the things that are important to us are in our hearts. They're not necessarily in our objects. Um, my mum always has a go at me because uh, I deliberately don't have house insurance. Um, and the reason I don't have house insurance is, is exactly that. Um, so I, I like to go through life knowing that all of these possessions are temporary and they could all just get stolen in the night and then that would be okay and she's always like but what would you do about this i'm like well there's nothing in here mum, that's that expensive to replace so by saving all the money from not paying house insurance for 20 years like if i ever need to do that the money's going to be there so i that's always been my my sort of you know little way of of just reminding myself all the time i mean obviously we've got buildings insurance in case the roof caves in because i think that's prob that's probably important but uh yeah, just in terms of like the possessions and stuff, I, I, I'd much rather live in a way where I'm not coveting stuff and I'm not like, you know, too attached to things. And, um, and you know, I could, ultimately I, I feel like I can let go of it a bit more easily that way. Well, because then we go back to the possessions possessing you, don't we? Yeah. And and actually, you know, you, you can't take any of this stuff with you. Um, but you just, you can take experiences with you. And a lot of my clients now, you know, they say, I don't want gifts, just give me experiences, yeah. you know, gift me yeah, an experience sure. because that is something, you know, that you can, that you can hold on to and you can remember, you don't necessarily need, you know, more stuff, but that's a whole nother conversation. Mm. Yeah. And we've got a couple of minutes left and I wanted to touch about procrastination because it does feel like that is, you know, really at the heart of of where clutter comes from it comes back to that thing that um clutter is decisions that haven't been made another little line that you say in the book which i really love is um clutter buries trauma which i was like oh that's 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 so deep and so true but you talk about the procrastination equation um in your book and and reading that book so do you want to just talk just about procrastination your take on it and you know Maybe also just how that relates to to work as well as to clutter, right? Like what can people 
uh, best do about um, things they're procrastinating on? Well, I, I spoke to someone the other day and she said, oh, you know, I I am running a business and, you know, da, 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 da. And I said, uh, anyway, we uncovered that basically a lot of procrastination, a lot of her procrastination was about her perfectionism. So, you know, quite often, I think um, when we want to do something really, really well, um, it kind of freezes us. And um, I mean, in business, there's the, you know, you know, this minimal viable product, you know, just make it and get it out there. Um, But actually, when you're a perfectionist and you want to do it perfectly, and actually, do you know what? A lot of people with cluttered homes are perfectionists and you wouldn't believe it, but they are. And and they want to do it really well. And because they can't see how to do it and do it really well, they they get into this freeze mode. And it's the freeze that then feeds the procrastination. And and it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. So, you know, perfectionism is a real killer. Um, It it just does really, um, I, I mean, I suffer from it really badly as well. So, you know, and I, I really had to overcome a lot of procrastination. So you suffer from um, just perfectionism getting in the way of things that you want to do. Yeah, I've got really, I've got really high standards. I mean, my, you know, I was writing this book for years. (laughs) And, um, you know, I I think um, I've read, read about other, other people. And, you know, they say some brilliant movies have been, books have been written and some brilliant movie scripts. And, and actually a lot of movies that get put out are not perfect. You know, we don't know that when we're watching it because they because we see it. But actually, there's a level of um, non-perfection that you need to be able to. Otherwise, you'll never finish anything. And and just to come back to that point, that actually, you know, I I talk to people about the the it's, it's so essential that you complete things. You know, because quite often people will go around and they'll give up just before they're about to complete something. And it's when you complete something that you get that sense of achievement or that sense of, um, I don't know, what what's it like if you've got six books on the go and you haven't finished any of them? You know, it, it scatters you. Yeah. You know, so just finish what finish two of them and then move on to the next one. But it and or if you've got lots of knitting projects on the go, finish something. Um, so a lot of people will find that it's, you know, that feeds into the procrastination cycle is, is not completing things. Yeah. Uh, there's two, two things that come to mind with that, um, that I try and live by. And I think are just really useful around procrastination and, and sort of, you know, putting stuff out into the world. One is, I think it's Leonard Cohen who said, um, great, great art is never finished, only abandoned. Mm-hmm. So, oh. <laughs> that one really heavy yeah. deep. Um and then um and then there's like the the Steve Jobs thing he used to say real artists ship. So the idea is like uh, you've got to put the thing in the box and you've got to deliver it out to to somebody Absolutely. else. Um but also my editor yeah. once um told me when I was um working on Productivity Ninja I was really concerned about spelling mistakes being missed and all this and my editor said to me do you know there's still spelling mistakes in some of Shakespeare's books? <laughs> so for all that time, publishers have been trying to correct it and whatever, and there's still some there. And so it's like, oh, well, if it's good enough for, for the bard, it's probably <laughs> good enough for humble or productivity ninja. But it just kind of gives you this sense of um, of being able to, you know, slightly tone down that perfectionism and just say, actually, what's more important is that you ship it, you put it out into the world and, from there, good stuff will happen. I've just had the same thing with um, my book recently where this new book that I'm working on, uh, Kind, and I've had focus groups of people talking about it. And it's that moment, isn't it, where it goes from being a thing that's just in your head to it being a thing that now everybody else is experiencing it and they have some ownership over it and, and a little bit of agency about it if they're giving you feedback too, right? So something about, again, I suppose this kind of brings us full circle really, but it it shows you that there's always energy around our stuff, isn't there? So whether it's whether it's work, whether it's clutter, there's always some energy and some momentum to either be gained or lost, depending on uh, how we relate to it. Um, and maybe that's a good sort of place to round it off. Um, so uh, the book is uh, imminently out. Um, I think by the time this comes out, it will be out. And it's called The yeah. Secret Life of Clutter. Um, yeah. And I really enjoyed it. And yeah, just um, it, as I said um, during the conversation, 
surprisingly, uh, just a surprisingly emotional um, book to read. Um, but do you want to just um, tell everyone where they can connect with you? And also, like, can people can, can still people still get the Home Declutter Kit? Is that still Absolutely, available? You can so, get that. Yeah, that feels like a good place yeah. for people to start as well. Just uh, tell people where they can find out more. So um, you can get the Home Declutter Kit on um, Amazon.com or um, HelenSanderson.com. And The Secret Life of Clutter is out, um, available now for pre-order, and it's out on the 12th of May. And um, I just want to say that one of the reasons why I wrote the book was because there's a lot of shame that people feel around being cluttered. And you've been talking about your book about kind. And if I get anything from writing this book, I really hope that people will be kind to some of the people who shared their stories but also other people who are struggling with, you know, living in a cluttered home. Because I think ultimately my main aim is is to bring compassion and kindness. So um, The Secret Life of Clutter is out and, you know, please enjoy it and please share it. Thanks, Helena. What a lovely note to finish on. Um, thanks so much for being on Beyond Busy. Thank you. This video is sponsored by Think Productive, home of the Productivity Ninja. We help people and organizations to increase their impact and make space for what matters through a range of workshops, programs, and coaching. Head to thinkproductive.com to find out more. Are you interested in booking me as a speaker for your event? You wanna sign up for my Rev Up for the Week email? Do you wanna buy some of my books? Or do you just wanna find out what I'm doing right now? It's all at grahamalcott.com forward slash links. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share so we can make more. Thanks for watching.